access granted. In our last episode, we saw that Israel was at war with the Philistines. Guided by the hand of the Lord, David emerged victorious and Israel had won the day. David had slain Goliath. But a new threat had emerged. As the hand of God began moving on David's life, the hatred and jealousy of King Saul began to stir. He wanted David dead at all costs. A new war was beginning between the king of all of Israel and the son of Jesse. Through his wife Michael and his brother-in-law Jonathan, God saw to it that David would always be protected no matter what. However, that in itself would not stop the demented King Saul from carrying out plans of his own. Hello and welcome back to our Bethany Baptist Church Sunday School lesson. My name is Reverend Talmadge Miller Jr. and I'll be your teacher for today. Our lesson is going to be lesson 10 and we'll be coming from 1 Samuel chapter 19 verses 8 through 17. Our lesson title for today is Saul's Attempts on David's Life. This is a powerful, powerful chapter. As a matter of fact, chapter 18 before leads up to what it is that got us to this point where we are now. David has been a fantastic warrior. Since the moment that he killed Goliath, Saul would no longer allow him to go back home to his father, Jesse. Saul said, you will be with me and you will be a commander in my army. And from that day forward, he was. He was trained as a warrior. He was trained in the tactics and the concepts of war when it comes to Israel and their army. And he became a victorious warrior and general and the number one commander in Saul's army. There was no warrior like him in all the land of Israel. He was dynamic. And the key to it all, the Bible says that the Lord was with him and he was successful in every campaign, especially against the Philistines. But something happened. Something major happened that shut all of that down, not really shut it down, but made him have some major problems along the way. So let's take a look at verse 8 starting off and then we'll get into and we'll delve into why all of these things were happening as they were. Verse 8 says this, And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter and they fled from him. Now, as we look at scripture, we see something that the Israelites and the Philistines were constantly at war, especially during the time of King Saul and during the time of David. It was something that was recurring a bit. And we remember the book of Judges speaks about one judge in particular who was born. His birth was specifically because God wanted him to begin to destroy the Philistines and to take the oppression off of the neck of Israel. And now this fight continues hundreds of years later. And we're seeing that David again is caught up in another campaign to destroy the Philistines. But it's interesting the Bible says that and there was war again with the Philistines. But if we examine the scripture, if we examine between chapter 18 all the way leading up to verse 8 in chapter 19 we're seeing that this isn't the first war that David is really fighting. In reality, David is now faced with three different threats to himself. Those three different threats were, number one, the Philistines. Number two, King Saul. And number three was a war within himself. Let's look at these in a little bit more detail. The Philistines. The Philistines were a thorn in the flesh and they hated Israel. They had been sworn enemies of Israel for quite some time. Their history of harassing them goes as far back as the father of Israel, 
Isaac in the book of Genesis. The Philistines were stopping up the water wells that Isaac would dig up. They were constantly at war with them until David became king and put an end to them. This is something that they were having war with consistently the Philistines and it really doesn't stop until the reign of David. And after David's reign, you don't really hear too much about the Philistines anymore because he will continue to rout them. David was so ferocious in battle that he would make men drop their swords and run because of his strength, because of his tenacity, because of his leadership, and because of how God had blessed him as a warrior. I don't think the men in UFC could even stand up to David at this point in time. David was a beast. And so with that, the other words, the Philistines, as we will continue to read and see, we see, man, they didn't stand a chance and they ran from him because he was that much of a manly man. Now, the other threat that we see here was from King Saul. When you read chapter 18, you start to see some things transpire and it's crazy to see what they were. King Saul was the second threat to him. Why? Because Saul was jealous of David's fame. And Saul was the king. The scary thing about this as well is that David had nowhere to run because David now lived in the confines of Saul's home. Remember, Saul would not let David go back home after that. Saul was so caught up with who David was and how he destroyed this giant that no other man would step to that Saul said, I have got to have you here with me. You will be with me. You will command my armies. Whatever it is that God has placed on you, I want that at my side so that we can continue to be victorious. And so from that moment on, <laughs> the son of Jesse now was living with Saul. And so Saul would send David out on these campaigns to go and fight and destroy the Philistines. And he wouldn't always go by himself. Saul also, remember, Saul was also a warrior. But David was in a different class. Though Saul was victorious and we've seen him fight battles prior to this, something was different. God was no longer with Saul because Saul had rejected him with his whole heart and refused to repent. But David... David loved God. When God searched the earth and looked for a man who had a heart for him, God specifically said, that young man, him, he's the one who will be king and rule my people because he is a man who is after my heart. He desires to please me in everything that he does. That is who I, I, that is who I will anoint as the king of Israel. So again, the second threat to David was Saul. Let's read a little bit more about Saul that we have here with these classroom notes. Saul purposed in his heart to become David's enemy. He desired to see David dead. 1 Samuel 18 records twice that Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear. He sent David to battle because he wanted the Philistines to kill him and even used his own daughter as bait to have him killed. When we look at scripture, we see over and over again that there was something that pulled the hair trigger of Saul's jealousy. One day they were coming back from battle when as they were coming back from battle, the girls would come out with their tambourines and they made songs and they were dancing and giving praise to the warriors who came back. And David's name was slung around everywhere. Everybody knew about David and they loved him. But something happened this one day. These girls came out and they were singing this song that they created. They said that David has slain his ten thousands and that Saul has slain his thousands. That did it for Saul. That did it for that man. He lost his ever loving mind. And the Bible says that he became jealous of him. That his, jealous was, his jealousy was, was enraged, that it was inflamed. And from that moment on, Saul continued to look at David with a jealous eye. He said that David wants my kingdom. What all does he, does, he, does he have left to take? Everyone loves him. The women love him. Everyone praises him. God is with him. What else is there left for him aside to take my throne? The crazy part about it is David didn't even want his throne. David wasn't concerned with it. 
David was a loyal subject of Saul. And not one time did David ever mention taking Saul's place. At, one, at no time did David, David ever say, hey, look, I want to be king one day. He, didn't, he never said that. That man was innocent and doing what he could and was doing his best and God was behind him. And because God could see, or should I say, because Saul could see the hand of God moving on David's life, Saul was jealous. Because at one point in time, he had that hand on his life. But then he got pumped up with pride. And once he got pumped up with pride and refused to repent and continue to live life like he wanted to, God said, through Samuel, your kingdom would have lasted forever. But now because you have rejected God, God himself has found another man who is after his heart, who will love him. And the crazy thing is, though Saul was physically on the throne, Saul was no longer king of Israel. But now there was also a, a third threat, a third war that was going on with the man David. And that was a war within himself. Let's look at the classroom notes again. Any believer will ask the Lord, where is he when they suffer? David had no peace on or off the battlefield. Even when he was home in his own bedchamber, in his own bed, Saul wanted him killed. Yet scripture made it plain. God was still with him and he was successful. But at this time in his life, he was always at war. The man had no peace. He served this king loyally. Not only did he serve this king loyally, but he also served the one and true living God. And even though he was serving God and God was with him and he was successful in all that he did, the internal strife. And the fact that he had no peace when he was at work on the battlefield and he had no peace when he was at home either is something that will mess a man up. That man was stressing on the inside. That man was constantly thinking, what have I done to deserve such a fate? What have I done to this king to make him want to hate me so much? Everything that he asked of me to do, I do it and I do it well. Why is he personally trying to take my life? In the last chapter, we saw that twice Saul took his spear and he hurled it at David because he tried to pin him to the wall and kill him. But twice he missed. David eluded him, got away. But Saul wasn't done. He wanted that man's life. And the reason why these things were transpiring is because just like Pharaoh back in Exodus, he would not listen to Moses to say, let my people go. God himself hardened the heart of Pharaoh. And in this manner, Saul completely rejecting God, God is leaving the door open for his insanity to increase. For him to go even further than he ever would before with his sinful heart, with his pride and arrogance. Remember, pride and arrogance is the same sin that turned Lucifer into Satan being lifted up because of his own accomplishments and because of who he is. And in like manner, Saul is doing the exact same thing. And with it, if these things go unchecked, if we continue to live like this and reject God, God will completely remove his hand of protection, of blessing, of sanity, of everything that there is that he gives us in our lives. He will completely remove his hand and allow for sin to have its way in our lives because we have chosen sin over him. Let's go to the next verse. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall and David fled and escaped that night. Now this is very interesting because we know that there is no evil in the Lord God. We know that God is holy and everything about God is holy and everything that God makes is good. But something happens when God makes things that are good 
us who, who live and breathe, we make a choice on whether we want to honor God or whether we want to dishonor God. We make a choice of whether we want to uh, be holy or whether we want to pervert the holiness of God. And so going way back before God said, let there be, and there was no earth and there was uh, no land or water. Uh, there was a place that still exists now where God lives, it's called heaven. And in that place, the third heaven, where God lives, there were angels, which there still are angels there now, but there was a greater capacity of them at one point in time. And these angels, there was one, of course, that we spoke of, his name was Lucifer. Lucifer made a choice to go against God because he wanted to sit on God's throne. He wanted to be God. And so Lucifer, with his wisdom and his tenacity and his foolishness and his pride, went and he convinced a third of the angels in heaven to follow him. And there was war in heaven and they fought against Michael and his angels and they were defeated and they lost their place for eternity in heaven. Those angels we now call demons or demonic spirits or evil spirits. Those guys lost their place in heaven and now they are here on the earth and they cause chaos and they, uh, they get into the mind and the heart of men. They possess men and, and make them do things that ordinarily a mind would not do. They pervert things. They bend the very things that God had that were straightened out and people are convinced that this is okay the way they live their lives. These are the things that demons do in short description. So what God did, God still being sovereign who he is. God reigns and God rules and God overrules however he sees fit. Because Saul rejected God, God said, I got something for you, right? See. You can get by with sin, but you can't get away. God himself will use anything that he needs to to be able to get your attention, to break you, or to just have you go through some things <laughs> simply because of your disobedience. There's always a consequence to sin. Always. You never get away with sin. And because Saul rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, he rejected God the Father, God said, I got something for you. So God, the same God that had the, the angels kicked out of heaven and, and now they're demonic angels, he personally chose one particular demon. Hey, you come here, you evil spirit. You come here. I'm going to give you an assignment. You, go down, and I want you to torment, and I want you to harass Saul. That's what I want you to do. And you come when I tell you to come, and when I tell you that's enough for now, you leave him be. The demon had no choice but to go and do what it is that God is instructing him to do. God is sovereign. We have seen times in scripture when the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, when he walked the earth, and demons were inside of men. And when they were there, they were about to confess who he was. But Jesus would tell them, shut up, come out of him. And guess what? The demons would shut their mouths and they would come out of them because Christ still rules and reigns. He is still sovereign. If those demons are trying to do something and Christ say do something different, they got to do it. The man at the gatherings, the man who was demon possessed and he was naked and in the tombs and screaming and crying all night long and cutting himself and breaking chains. The Bible says he had a legion of demons in him. Matter of fact, they called themselves a legion. And at that time, in the Roman writings, a legion was understood to be about 2,500 men, depending on what time during the Roman reign there was. So this man possibly had at least 2,500 demons in them, tormenting him night and day. And when Christ came on the scene, the demons ran to him and said, what do you have to do with us? They recognized who he was. And Jesus said, come out of this man. And they were about to come out and they said, Lord, send us into something. Send us into the pigs. They couldn't go nowhere without his permission. And so the Lord said, all right, you can go to the pigs. And they went and jumped in the pigs and they went and they drowned all the pigs in that water. The demons have to do what Christ says. And even if God assigns a demon to a particular man's life because of his disobedience to break him, to get him to return, or because that's his chastisement, the Lord God will do it. And in this case, we see this with Saul. Saul 
decided to again reject the Lord Jesus Christ and not repent. And so God said, I got something for you. And this did nothing but amplify the evil that was already in his heart and made him want to kill David even more so. In our lives, we have to ensure that we don't leave the door open for demonic activity to happen. We have to ensure that we don't turn our back to Christ because the moment that we do, now demons can come in and interact with us in our lives. If we have the Spirit of God, they can't possess us. Oh, but they can bring something that, that shines and twinkles in a way like none other to derail us and take us off the path that God has us on. And he will have us in a corner for a long time wondering, how did I get this far away from God? Simply because we turned our back to him. Let's keep reading. Again, when we look at verse 10, it says, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence. And he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Verse 11 says, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house. He wasn't done. He said, now, nah, bruh, you think this because you're running away? I know where you live. You live on my confines. My mansion is here. You live in my mansion. And if your own certain wing of the house, you live, I got you. You got to come home. My daughter is your wife. You got to come home. And when you do, guess what? I got you. Verse 11 again. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. Now see, this is what we call wickedness. It's morally corrupt. It's not just a bad idea, right? It's not just a desire that's in the heart that's bad. No, it's an extension of it. It's a continuation of it. It is trying to make the reality of what I think and what's in my heart physically manifest by putting this plan together, putting people in motion, and making them do what it is that I want them to do with the authority and the power that I have. Saul was abusing his power. Saul was abusing his authority. And now he got some scoundrels. You know what scoundrels are? The, the no good, the low lifes, who have no moral composition, who don't have a conscience anymore, right? Who will do anything for money. They exist everywhere. You might know a scoundrel or two. I'm praying to God that you're not a scoundrel, but you might know a scoundrel or two who will do anything to anybody just so they can get ahead for money, for prestige, for status, they will do whatever they want or whatever you want them to do just so they can come up. These are the low lives who were in the kingdom that God himself established, right? That God himself put this man Saul on the throne of it because he was giving Saul a chance to be a rightful king and Saul started off good, but now Saul has drifted into madness. When you look at Romans chapter 1, it speaks about how God will give you up to the very sin nature that you choose over him. And that's what God has done here. He has given Saul up to the madness that he wants to pursue. And Saul is losing his mind. And now he wants to kill his son-in-law simply because of jealousy. Simply because he now wants to be as renowned as David is. He wants the blessings that David has. But killing David won't solve that issue. A reconnection with the Lord Jesus Christ will, right? <laughs> if you get back right in the place of where God wants you to be, the Lord has no problem with reconnecting with you, okay? He has no problem with reconciling with you. All you have to do is say, Father, forgive me with a sincere and a genuine heart. And then you now begin to operate in the will of God and God will establish you where he wants you to be. He will bless your life. He will change you so that you now can see through the eyes of the Lord of what is morally wicked and, and what is righteous. He will change things for you and it won't happen overnight. But then again, sometimes it can. However God wants to do with his sovereign will and power, God will do if we allow him to. But when we go in the opposite direction, now we will begin to do things like Saul himself is doing here. Again, let's read verse 11 again. It says, Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, 
If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So some way, somehow, his wife Michael got wind of the plan that her father had for David. She found out, and as soon as she found out, she came home. See, when David ran away, David eventually came back home. And Saul knew he was going to come back home. So Saul said, hey, hey, all of y'all, I need you three, four me. I need y'all to come over here. David needs to die today. He needs, he needs to be dead by the morning time. So what I need you to do is I need you to go and watch over the house. And as you watch over where his house is, inconspicuously, he does not need to know that you were there. You need to hide. When he falls asleep, you need to kill him in his sleep. That's what I want you to do. And most likely he probably promised them a reward for doing this thing here that was on his heart and on his mind. Saul's anger and hatred for David was so real that people knew about it. When you read the top of this chapter, verse 1 says, hey, Saul went and told his son, right, at Jonathan, Ishvi, uh, Malkishua, he told his sons, and he told his servants, kill David. David has to die. And as they hear this, they're like, what you mean? Kill David? Do you know what David has done? And you tripping, man, right? And none of them jumped on it, but Remember, he found some scoundrels, some lowlifes, who don't care nothing about David or about what's right or what's wrong. They just want the money, right? And he found them so they can kill him. And so now they're waiting outside and there's a secret conversation going on between David and his wife. And Michael says, bruh, you need to get up out of here. My daddy is a little cuckoo and he's coming to kill you. And there's some men out here who are trying to kill you. We gotta get you out of here, baby. I love you, I don't want you to die. And so scripture says she assists him, okay? We want to look at the division between Michael and we want to look at the division between these scoundrels, right? So when you look at Michael, chapter 18 also brings more information about her, right? Originally, David wasn't going to marry Michael. David was supposed to marry Mirab, the older daughter of Saul. But Saul, David was like, I mean, I don't have nothing against her, but I'm a commoner. Who am I that I would marry into royalty? I watch sheep for a living, and I'm just happy to be here serving the king because of God's grace. Who am I that I should marry into this? And so when it came down time for David to marry her, she was given away to another man. But Saul had another daughter, and she was crazy about David. Oh, she loved David. Remember, the Bible says that David was handsome and ruddy. He was a good-looking young man, right? And then, not only that, he probably had, you know, some little muscles or something. He was a good-looking young man. And David had a way with himself where everybody just loved him, his personality, who he was. And he was successful. And he lived in the castle with the king. He ate at the table with them. He was a commander. He was on top of his game. He was legendary. He killed Goliath. And he slew no telling how many number of Philistine warriors. David was the man that every girl wanted. Every girl wanted. And now, this young lady, she hears from her father, Saul, hey, how would you like it if I hooked you up with David? She'd have lost her mind. Oh my God, David, what? Are you serious? This is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to arrange the marriage where you will marry David if David fulfills what it is that I'm asking him to do. When David went to war and he did that. So let's read up a little bit about Michael, okay? Michael started off as a fan of David, not knowing him personally and dreaming of what it would be like to be his. Her admiration and love for David was real. They were married and she became David's first wife. Even though they were married because of the evil scheme of Saul, God will ensure that what the child of God needs will always be supplied. David needed help. And if not for Michael's words of warning, David would have died. So God, even though Saul had an evil plan that he put into motion, God himself said, okay, you go ahead and do that. And I'm going to use what you tried to use and switch it around. And because of the relationship between Michael and David, I'm going to bless David and I'm going to use her to save his life, though you want to use her to get him killed. See how God works? 
God can take the very thing that people use against you to destroy you and kill you, and he can take that and be like, whoop, flip it, and guess what? <laughs> I'm going to use the very same thing to save this man's life or elevate him into a higher position. So you have the scoundrels, and then you have Michael, who loves David. And as a Christian, always remember this. People will love you because you love Christ and they see the Christ in you. And then people will hate you because they see Christ in you. Everybody's not going to like you, man. And people who like you now can and will hurt you. There is something called church hurt where people in the church who you may have grown up with and encouraged you all your life will come and one day they will do something or say something that will break your heart and hurt your feelings. And many people in church have actually stepped away from church because of church hurt, <laughs> really and truly. But we should expect these things when they come. We should expect it and we should still love the people of God because remember, the church is like a hospital. We are all broken people who have been made whole through Christ and Christ continues to build on us. And there are things that some of us need to work on. The way we talk to people, our attitudes, the way we treat people, our tolerance, our patience, our love. God wants to build that all up in us in the correct way. And we have to remember that even though people are Christians, everybody's not on the same level. We have to all grow into the things that Christ wants us to be able to do. We have to learn how to forgive, how to love one another, how to tithe. There are so many things that we need to learn and grow in when it comes to our Christian life. And this is why God wants us to exhibit grace to others even when they offend us. Even when they coming for you. Some people want to come for you. They don't like you and they want to push you out the way. And they, make, they go out their way to make it known that, hey, I don't like this person. But continue on in the grace of God, show God's grace, and continue to be loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. Love one another, but stand up as a man and do what's necessary and let God lead the way. So we're getting close to our conclusion. Let's keep going, okay? Verse 12 says, So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. So when we look at this, we're seeing something that we did not see before. In the house of David is what they call a household idol. Okay, And this idol is something very similar to what we see in other nations where they would worship false idols. <laughs> they would worship false gods. And oftentimes they would take idols and bring them in their home for some sort of protection or some sort of blessing that they're looking for and they will pray to this particular idol. Now guess how that idol got in the house? Michael. <laughs> that household idol was something that she brought about. Why? Because she's living under the lunacy of her father. And remember, what happened to Saul on the day before he died? Remember, God was no longer answering him because he wouldn't repent and turn from his sin. He completely abandoned God and God completely abandoned him. So where did Saul go? Saul went to the witch of Endor to bring up a dead spirit, Samuel, to speak to him. And guess what? God did something he's never done again in scripture. He brought up the spirit of Samuel to speak to Saul. And it shook not only Saul, but that witch who was fake who never knew how to bring up a dead spirit. And when she actually saw it, she was like, oh my God. So this is not uncommon as you continue to look, okay? Now this also could cause problems for them later on because there were some things that we saw later on with David and Michael, they didn't get along good. And this could possibly also be related to that as well. We don't know, but we do know in the house of David was a household idol. And for sure, for sure, it was brought about by Michael. She used that household idol to be able to fool these men. Let's keep reading. Verse 14 says, And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. Man, that's got to be all kind of craziness. This man is supposedly sick. Let's just say he really was sick in the bed. Saul said, I don't care. Bring the whole bed 
bring him up in the bed, bring him to me, and I will kill this man myself. That's a demonic mindset. That's wickedness. Saul was so far gone, he didn't even realize how far gone he was. And the people saw how far gone he was, but because of his position and authority, they were afraid to say anything about it. Verse 16 says, And when the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, Why have you deceived me so? And sent away my enemy, that he is escaped. And Michael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? What we're seeing here is the lunacy of King Saul. And we're seeing what happens when a person is far removed from God. When they make the conscious decision to abandon the Lord Jesus Christ and to follow their own pursuits and desires and they are in a position of authority to do all kind of madness. He wanted again to preserve his arrogance, his position, the way he looked in front of other people. But he missed the number one thing that he would always need. The blessings that can only come from God. And now we see he's now put Michael in the position of nervousness, of uncomfortableness. Now she's stressing because the husband, the man that she loves, is gone. Her father wants to kill him. And now she stands before the king not knowing what he's capable of because he himself is crazy. And if he's willing to kill David the way that he is and abandon the Lord Jesus Christ, what would he do to her? And so now she's in a position where she is lying. She wants to preserve her life. It's never okay to lie. Never. God doesn't approve of it. But we see why she's lying. She's lying because she's terrified and afraid. So much so that she made up something and said, if I didn't do it, he would have killed me. Right? <laughs> That's crazy to be that afraid of your father because he has lost his mind. Fathers, it's important for us to understand our position as fathers. It's important for us to understand the steps that we lay before our children for them to follow in needs to be ones that we are ourselves following because we are following the Lord Jesus Christ. That we are continuously doing things that are pleasing and honoring to God so that our children will know how to live a life that's pleasing and honoring unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It is important in a way that words cannot even describe. And when these things don't happen, then now we not only set ourselves up for failure to miss God's blessing, but we also put that in the minds and the hearts of our children. And it will continue from generation to generation, and it will get worse. And so we want to make sure that we don't follow into the steps of King Saul. We want to honor God, and we want to live like David. One of the main lessons that we're seeing with David at this point in time is this. Just because you are a Christian does not mean that you are free from worry, from stress, from people trying to take your life, and for people to make you look bad in front of others. <laughs> You're not free from that. And if anybody tells you that, they're lying to you. It's not true. David was still blessed, even in the midst of the stressfulness that he was going through. Even in the midst of the strife and the warfare that he had in his heart, and when he faced on the battlefield and off the battlefield, the Bible says something that's major. And that major thing was that God was still with him and that he still had a heart for God. He never abandoned the Lord. Many people abandoned Jesus and, and the faith and, and, and the church because stuff ain't work out for me. I, I tried that Bible stuff and it didn't work. I tried praying for my enemy and they still my enemy. You're not responsible for what they do. You're responsible for obeying what it is that God has called us to do. And then you leave the rest in the hands of the Lord. But a true believer in Christ Jesus is not going to abandon God. We will ask, Lord, where are you? Lord, why are these things happening? Lord, what do I do? How do I continue to be faithful in the midst of this? Because, Lord, it hurt right now. I don't understand right now. I don't have peace in my heart right now, Lord. Help me. Everything is hitting me from all sides. I don't know what to do. These are things that a real believer will confess to you. If somebody goes around and say they have no problems, no worries, because I'm a child of God, I'm blessed and highly favored, and they act like nothing ever bothers them or nothing is ever wrong whenever you ask them how they doing, they lying. Don't believe the hype. Don't believe the hype. 
We are all going to go through things if we are children of God. Even more so because Satan wants us. He desires to kill us. But God himself says, I will not leave you nor forsake you. If you are truly his, hold on to your faith. Even when it seems like nothing is going to work out and you've been long suffering for a long time. God still got you. He has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten about you. And when he comes through, he'll come through big. Pastor Hall always says this. God may not pay every Friday, but he sure enough pays. Believe that. I thank you for your time. Pray that this lesson has blessed your heart, your soul, and your mind. Um, if you do not know the Lord, now is the time to be able to trust him as Lord and Savior. If you have never come to Jesus and have never been forgiven of your sins, the Lord is waiting and knocking at the door of your heart. And he's looking to forgive you and create a place for you with him in heaven for eternity. It's not a fantasy. It's not a game. It's real. And he will save you and forgive you of your sins if you ask him. If this message has pricked your heart, if the Lord has been talking to you this week or just today, and you want to give your life to Christ, repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, and I know that I need to be forgiven of my sins. I have heard your gospel about your son, Jesus Christ, how he lived in heaven and came down to put on human flesh to forgive me and to die for my sins. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that he died on Calvary's cross for my sin, and I believe that he rose again by his own power after three days. Lord, I repent of my sins. I turn away from my sins and I, I change my mind about how I see things and I want to see it the way that you do. I repent. And Lord, I trust you as my Lord and my Savior. I transfer my trust from myself to you, knowing that only you and trusting that only you have the power to forgive sin and to save me from my sins and from an eternity in hell. I trust you. Be the Lord of my life today. And I will do my best to live from you from here on. If you prayed that prayer, then now say this. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. I'll continue to trust you and grow in faith from this moment on. And live for you from this day on. Amen. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. Hey, bro, what you read? Oh, nothing, nothing. Why am I so nervous? Why, why am I so scared to tell him? Lord, give me the strength to tell him, please. You gon' be somebody, you gon' be somebody, you gon' be somebody, I'm somebody in Christ. This ain't no time to be no coward if you know you've been saved. I'ma be like Joshua, God told him be brave. So I stick my chest out and I brag on my Lord. Cause he came and touched my life. Now I'm telling the world that I am somebody. I'm somebody in Christ. So forgive when people say when they talk God in your life. If you know you got Jesus, you know you've been saved. You better act like you know and start living it every day. You a child of God, the creator of life. You a royal priesthood and have eternal life Man, I used to be scared when I came into church To lift my hands and praise the Lord for all that is worth I didn't know who I was, I thought that it was a goal To get up by my seat of praise and thought I looked like a fool But look, God, you have changed me and put you out of stand Thank you, God, for your salvation and making me who I am What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the king? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon be somebody? I'm somebody in Christ what you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the team? You gon' be somebody, you gon' be somebody, you gon' be somebody, I'm somebody in Christ. What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Now let me tell you about the king of kings and all the gifts he brings to somebody with somebody Living a life for Christ, the person sacrifice The second person of God's triune trinity Descended down from heaven and step in human history Born of a virgin, fulfilling all of the prophecies The greatest special savior and not merely a prophet 500 people deny, he resurrected on high He led captivity captive, giving gifts to you and I Divinely applied 
Yeah, he's my guy. He took his measure and ride. Putting men up in their place. Some are giving a preach. Some are giving a teach. And some be apostles. Apostles of the gospel. Some are giving a mercy. Some are giving a heal. However, God deals that a man just yield. What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the king? Are you gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? I'm somebody in Christ. What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the king? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? I'm somebody in Christ. What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the king? Are you gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? I'm somebody in Christ. What you gon' do? Who you gon' be? Are you gonna live for Jesus Christ and serve the king? Are you gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? You gon' be somebody? I'm somebody in Christ.